It's that time of year to talk about pollinators, and today we're choosing butterflies. Let's get our butterfly on starting right now. Welcome to the Weird and Wacky Planet's Nature Just Got Real podcast for kids. Join KB Carr, author of the Weird and Wacky Planet series with Chuck Darwin, Tito and Captain Jack as they bring you the real skinny on what's really going on in the natural world. And now, here's your host, KB Carr. Hello, Planeteers. I'm KB Carr, author of the Weird and Wacky Planet series and host of this podcast for kids, Nature Just Got Real. Today, we are talking all things butterflies. But first, I want to welcome our new listeners in Germany. Hello. Germany had the most downloads from outside the U.S. for the last episode. Also, for the first time, we had listeners in Costa Rica, Belgium, the Grenadines, Poland, Japan, and Ireland. Welcome. And the city that had the most downloads was a tie between Spanish Forks, Utah, here in the United States, and Brampton, Ontario, and Canada. Thank you so much, all of you, for listening. If you're watching this on video, uh, which you can do on YouTube and possibly other places, there will be pictures inserted here and there of the butterflies we're talking about. But if you're just listening and you're interested in seeing pictures of these butterflies, you'll find a downloadable PDF in the show notes. It might be helpful to have that to look at while listening to the episode uh, so you can see these amazing insects for yourself as we talk about them. Let's get started. While they aren't the biggest pollinators on the planet, butterflies certainly are quite fascinating. I learned so much from Tito's weird facts, and I'm sure you will too. I had the pleasure of interviewing Steve LeWare, the Vice President of Horticulture at Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, about their wonderful butterfly exhibition called the Fred and Dorothy Fitcher Butterflies Are Blooming. And every year they put on a dazzling display of butterflies in a five-story glass enclosure that you can walk through and have a magical close encounter with many different species of tropical butterflies. And now, enjoy my interview with Steve as he tells us about the exhibition, why butterflies are important, and more importantly, what we can do to help them. So today, I'm really excited to have on with us Mr. LeWare, who is the Vice President of Horticulture at Meyer Gardens, um, who, which is in my town here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he's going to tell us a little bit about butterflies, pollinators, and their exhibit that they have going on right now. Welcome, Mr. LeWare. Hey, thanks for having me very much, Ms. Carr. I, I love your, your program, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you today. Thank you so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. And we really want to know that the first thing we want to start off with is what exactly is horticulture and a horticulturist? And what, what, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, you know, so a lot of these words and science are, you know, kind of long, but I like to break them down into the smaller Latin parts. And that kind of helps me have a better understanding of, of what they mean. So yeah, if you I look at, that. yeah. So if you look at horticulture, um, hort is a, is a root word in Latin that comes from hortus, which just means garden. And then um, culture is a, uh, has its root in Latin, in Latin, meaning, you know, to, to cultivate. And so um, horticulture um, in general just means, you know, the cultivation of gardens. But uh, um, I have a, a, a definition that I really like um, that, that goes like this. So horticulture is the culture of plants for food, comfort, or beautification. So um, horticulture is just that art and science of growing plants and gardens, either for beauty, food, um, or uh, for comfort. You know, like house plants would be something that would be for comfort. So, um, so that's horticulture. I love it. How and how did you? What did you have to do to become a horticulturist? What What does that involve? Yeah, you know, so 
um, when I, I went to college and um, one of the things that was really, really interesting to me as a, a young person um, was uh, forensic pathology. There was a, actually a TV show um, in the eighties that I used to watch all the time called Quincy. And uh, basically a, a forensic pathologist is someone who figures out why someone died. And we've got a lot of TV shows that are out now like CSI and some of those things that are similar to that. Right. Um, but that really piqued my interest. And so when I started in school, um, I started in zoology, which is another word that has to do with animals, started in zoology and in pre-med um, uh, with the idea that I would uh, get into forensic pathology. And I ended up having to take a couple of botany classes, so a couple of plant classes as part of that. And um, it was just really, really interesting to me. And I ended up uh, changing my major and pursuing a degree in botany. And um, I always enjoyed being outside. I always mowed lawns as a kid for extra money. And, um, you know, I was always playing around in the dirt. So uh, in hindsight, it was a, a good match for me. Excellent. I like that. So, so you, you went to college, it started on one path and then switched to another. So you guys, that's totally possible to do. You're not it locked is, in stone. Yeah. Once you start, once you start a path, you don't have to stay on it. You can find something right. more interesting and, and take that path. I, I really like stories like that. I love that. Yeah. All right. So we're going to get kind of down to the nitty gritty and talk about butterflies because this show is about butterflies as pollinators and you guys have like a super cool exhibit at the gardens uh, that you do every year uh, can you tell us about that yeah so this is actually the 27th year for this exhibition and the full name of the exhibition is the um, Fred and Dorothy Fichter butterflies are blooming exhibition and uh, we have a tropical conservatory so a conservatory is you know, basically a glass house. And we have a tropical conservatory that's five stories tall and um, 15,000 square feet as far as the footprint goes. And um, there are over 7,000 butterflies that um, are ended up, end up being released and that fly free in that tropical space. And they're all tropical butterflies um, from places like Costa Rica and Ecuador and uh, parts of uh, tropical China and uh, other areas of Asia, the greater Asia. And um, it's just a really neat opportunity uh, for people to see these beautiful uh, creatures uh, up close and, you know, in person. So that's really butterflies of the world, isn't it? So you'd have to keep that temperature controlled and uh, to be able to do that, wouldn't you? We do, yeah. It's it's 85, between 80 and 85 degrees, um, high humidity. Um, so it's just like the tropics when you walk into that, into that space. And, um, you know, it's interesting because since they are, and you and I, I think we'll talk a little bit more about butterflies and the way that they're insects and pollinators and that type of thing. But being in Michigan... Um, these tropical insects, these tropical butterflies are non-native. So there's a lot of restriction. You know, we get into a lot of problems out in nature when non-native bugs move from one place to another. So we have to be very, very careful with how we treat these because, because they're insects. And um, there's regulations from the United States Department of Agriculture and other government um, agencies, you know, that regulate how we display these, these beautiful creatures. Good to know. Yes, good to know, because that would be um, non, you know, invasive species are a problem uh, in several areas. So that would be, that's good to know. Okay, no escapees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. All right. And so um, what are the, what, why are butterflies important to us? Why, why do you guys have this exhibit? Why, why is this an important thing to, for us to, uh, sure. To, to see? Well, I think first, you know, the probably the easiest thing to wrap our minds around when we think of why are butterflies important is just that, you know, they have uh, just an intrinsic value in their beauty. You know, they are just, you know, cool insects. And um, that should be reason enough that, 
you know, we, we preserve um, these uh, creatures. But, you know, uh, butterflies are uh, more than that. There are several hundred species of butterflies and moths. And usually when you talk about butterflies, they're lumped in with moths because they're in a bigger group of insects called Lepidoptera, which is another fancy uh, word, uh, way we group uh, different things together. And, and um, so butterflies are, are part of a bigger group called Lepidoptera, which include moths. And um, they do a lot for the environment. When you look at the life cycle, of a butterfly that includes the larva or the caterpillar. They you know, start out as an egg, they hatch from the egg into a caterpillar or a larva. Uh, that larva pupates or forms a cocoon or a chrysalis, and then it emerges from that uh, cocoon or chrysalis um, into an adult butterfly. And so there's multiple stages within that life cycle that uh, butterflies and moths can be food for other creatures. You know, there's ants that will eat the eggs. There are all sorts of birds and reptiles and other organisms that will eat the caterpillar stage or the larva stage. Um, and then even as butterflies, there are food sources sometimes for uh, birds. I mean, so many of the butterflies have all these beautiful colors and patterns because they're trying to avoid being prey uh, from, from something else. So um, they're a food source. And then they're also uh, a pollinator in many instances. Uh, butterflies have, and moths, uh, typically have a specialized mouth part um, that is like a straw that will unfurl. And um, the way they eat is by dipping that mouth straw uh, called a proboscis down into the tubular flowers and drinking the nectar. And by doing that, they're touching all of the pollen and other parts of the, of the flower and transferring that pollen from one flower to another flower. So uh, they're, they're important pollinators in many cases. Thank you. I was, I was going to ask you how you pronounce that word. I've heard it pronounced two, two ways. <laughs> I think Chuck, uh, Chuck Darwin's going to tell us a little bit more about that later. Uh, and uh, Jack's going to go into what the difference is between a butterfly and a moth. So that'll be interesting Great. to learn that. Do you have any moths in the exhibit as well? We do, yeah. We predominantly have butterflies, but we do have um, uh, three to four different moths that um, you know will come throughout the, the exhibition. So we have things like uh, the African moon moth. We have the atlas moth. Um, there's an owl moth that um, um, is in the exhibition as well. Uh, the exhibition runs uh, two full months. And um, we're able to get in a little over 60 species of butterflies and moths. And they remind me a lot of uh, fruit in the sense that, you know, some fruit ripens um, earlier in the year and some fruit ripens later in the year. And so um, we receive these butterflies, you know, at the natural time that they would be available um, in, their, in their native location. And so... We get some of these butterflies earlier in our exhibition, and then some don't show up um, until later in the exhibition. So it's always uh, a surprise what comes in each week. Well, I'm going to try to get down there and get some uh, video footage for you guys, too, of, of the structure and the butterflies, and and uh, we'll see what's there when I get there. How That's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. All right. So... Um, I wanted to ask you what kinds of things affect the number of butterflies uh, and their effectiveness as pollinators. Like what kind of challenges do butterflies have uh, environmentally right now? Sure. Well, I think, you know, when you look at butterflies as being an insect and, um, you know, they're an insect first, you know, before they're a butterfly, if you think of it that way. And um, in general, insects are uh, very much impacted by the changes that we see within our environment. So when we have um, temperatures that are warmer, when we have um, storm systems that um, influence um, the, the climate, you know, all of those different things um, impact butterflies uh, like any other insect. Um, also butterflies, are a um, 
you know, they're affected by things like pesticides. They're affected by, um, you know, the lack of habitat in some instances. So when you look at, for example, uh, monarchs are um, a very familiar butterfly here in North America. And we talk a lot about monarchs and their migration and their relationship to milkweed and all those things. And so habitat changes, uh, changes within, um, you know, the diversity of plant material. All of those things end up impacting insects, which in turn impact uh, butterflies. Right, right. Thank you. All right. That's something to, to definitely explore further, things that we can do. And, and that was my next question. So what kind of things um, can kids do for butterflies in, in, in their backyards or their neighborhoods or their schools? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the important things that I think we can do as, um, you know, individual people, as individual kids is to pay a little bit more attention about what's going on in your full yard, you know, your own personal habitat. And um, I talked a little bit earlier about that life cycle, egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly. And um, butterflies are in our garden. And when we see an adult butterfly, we're only seeing part of that life cycle. And if we have a yard, for example, that's only attractive to adult butterflies, if it only has the flowers that butterflies like, uh, then we're not aiding in the completion of that life cycle. So if I go back to the monarch, for example, um, I think a lot of us have a familiarity with the fact that monarchs are associated with milkweed. So if you look at why that is, um, butterflies will typically only lay their eggs on certain plants. And for the monarch, that's milkweed. And the reason for that is that's the plant that the caterpillar likes to eat. So if you like cheeseburgers and I were to drop you off at some place that only serves rice, you would have a hard time, you know, eating your favorite food of a cheeseburger. Well, that's the same with a monarch. If, if the egg is laid on an oak tree, those caterpillars don't eat oak trees, so they would starve. So uh, that egg is only laid on milkweed. And uh, when, that, when that milkweed is eaten by the caterpillars, it's chewed up. You'll see holes in the leaves. You'll see leaves disappearing. Um, we have caterpillars in our, in our seasonal display house that will completely strip milkweed plants, you know, of all their leaves. They're voracious, uh, they have voracious appetites. So in our own yards, a lot of times we think, oh, if something is eating one of my plants, it's a bad thing. And um, a lot of times those things that are eating your plants are the larva of insects. So when I talk about the fact that you should take a greater view of your yard and, and have a better understanding of a life cycle of a butterfly, um, you know, if you have those plants in your yard and you want the life cycle to be there, you have to, you know, be familiar with the fact that some of your plants will be eaten by those uh, insects. And that's a good thing in order to create habitat. So um, I guess the cliff's notes of that or the short version of that is um, to have as many things uh, that are butterfly friendly and caterpillar friendly as you can planted in your yard. And then to allow those things to be eaten. So to not spray pesticides, to not, you know, try to eliminate um, insects from eating uh, that plant material that you've planted. Very important. Very important. I'm glad that you, that you brought that up. So support for all of the stages that gets to the pretty one that we see. Uh, there's a lot of other stages that have to happen first. So Correct. a lot of things we can Correct. do to support yeah. that. Excellent. Thank you. So, and what would you like, uh, what would you like kids to know? Well, you know, I think that um, there's so much that can be discovered um, by exploring your own yard, you know, by getting out on your hands and knees and, um, you know, moving plants around, looking at the underside of leaves, uh, maybe exploring with a magnifying glass occasionally. Um, 
I remember when my, I've got three children that are all uh, grown and out of the house now. Um, but when my children were younger, we used to have a lot of fun um, exploring the backyard and looking at, um, if we could find plants that were being chewed by something and, uh, and trying to figure out what was eating uh, that plant. And so um, just getting outside, exploring and um, asking questions, you know, if you don't know what something is, uh, try to figure out what it is, what's eating that plant. What is that bug that I found underneath this rock? You know, what are some of those things that I'm finding in my yard and how are they connected to the greater world around me? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Your own backyard is the best place to start. We talk about that Absolutely. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, and so tell me when the, the exhibit runs from what to what again? So the butterfly exhibition runs every year uh, for the months of March and April. And so uh, you can come anytime um, during the months of March and April, and uh, you'll be able to see these beautiful tropical butterflies. And then I mentioned just briefly caterpillars. We also have a room called the Seasonal Display House, where we have um, a butterfly garden, and you'll be able to search and find monarch caterpillars uh, that are munching away on many of those plants and uh, learn a little bit more about that life cycle that I talked about. Get to see them live. And I, I want to say that I saw um, also like a chrysalis room where you have them, the chrysalis hanging so we can see it at that stage as well. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> my light just turned off on me. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so the the chrysalis room, um, we call that the, the observation station. And that's a, uh, that's a small trailer that's parked in the uh, tropical conservatory. And it's got a beautiful glass front on it. And when all of those butterflies arrive, all those, those pupa arrive, uh, they're sorted by staff and they're hung in those windows so that you can see them. And then as those butterflies emerge and they're ready to fly, uh, they're collected by uh, staff and then released into the tropical conservatory. So you can observe all of that while you're here. Excellent. I cannot wait to get down and get some footage for that. If you guys are in uh, anywhere in Michigan or the environment in there, um, come and check out the exhibition and come down during your spring break. That would be cool. Yes. For those We're of open us late during spring break till 9 p.m. every every day during spring break. Spring so, break yeah, hours. Great. Good idea. Great idea. All right. And I will have all of the link to the, to the, to the website and all of that information in the show notes. So you can, you can check that out. And for those of you in other countries who, who can't come out, um, I'll see if I can get some, uh, some video footage of that, maybe put it as an, as an extra there at the end. Great. Right. So thank you so much, Mr. Lewer. We really appreciate you coming here and telling us about the exhibition and about butterflies and why they're important and what we can do to help them. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. My pleasure. You too. Right. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed learning about Butterflies with Steve as much as I did. And now here's a word from our sponsor, Weird and Wacky Planet. Have you ever seen a dragon covered in fingernails? How about a mermaid who vacuums the ocean floor every day? Or a pocket Dracula no bigger than your thumb? You can meet these animals and more in the book Weird and Wacky Endangered Creatures 1, part of the Weird and Wacky Planet series by KB Khan. Look for them wherever books are sold and get your flippers on your own coffee. Now Chuck Darwin is going to tell us about a big word that you get to decide how you want to pronounce. What do I mean? Tell us more, Chuck. It's time for the weird and wacky, weighty, wondrous word. For this episode, the word is proboscis or proboscis. What is it and how do you say it? First, we'll start with what it is. The dictionary describes it as a noun, meaning any long, flexible snout, like the trunk of an elephant or a tapir, the elongate, protruding mouth parts of certain insects adapted for sucking or piercing, or any of the various elongate feeding, defensive, or sensory organs of the oral region, as in certain leeches and worms. On a butterfly, of course, 
It will be the elongate protruding mouth part, although they do not use it to suck or pierce, but rather to absorb, much like a paper towel. It is how they take in nectar or other liquids for nourishment. Now, as to how you pronounce the word, there are two pronunciations that are present, and no one seems to know which is correct, although there are many opinions. You will find it pronounced both ways in various dictionaries, such as... Proboscis. Proboscis. I say proboscis because it comes from the Greek word for an elephant's trunk, proboscis which translates as means for taking food. And frankly, it's just more fun to say it. Whether proboscis or proboscis, use the word in a sentence today and impress someone with your genius. Until next time, I'm Dr. Chuck Darwin. Cheerio. Thank you, Chuck. I see what you mean about it being more fun to say proboscis. I'm going to say it that way, too, I think. Proboscis. Yep. Now, Captain Jack is here to answer a question that came up during our research for today's show. And you might have this question, too. Give us the facts, Jack. Got a question. Ask the captain. Ahoy, mateys. In this episode, today's Ask the Captain question is, what is the difference between a butterfly and a moth? I mean, they look a lot alike, right? They both have the same type of wings. They both hatch from eggs. They both start as caterpillars. So how can you tell which one you're looking at? Am I right? So here are eight differences that will help you when you spot one and want to know which one it is. Number one, look at their wings when they're resting. Moths tend to rest with their wings open, while butterflies tend to rest with their wings closed. But, sometimes butterflies will sunbathe with their wings open, so then you want to, number two, look at their antenna. Butterflies' antenna start slimmer, closer to their heads, and then get a little wider at the end, or even have a little tiny ball at the end. Moth antenna are either fuzzy or have more jagged edges. Number three, is it daytime or nighttime? Moths are nocturnal, meaning they fly mostly at night, and butterflies are diurnal, meaning they fly mostly during the day. Number four, color. Most moths tend to be duller or more neutral in color to better camouflage themselves, where butterflies tend to be brighter in color. Not all of them, but if your little friend is a bright color, chances are pretty good that it's a butterfly. And there you have it. Go out into your neighborhood and see if you can find butterflies or moths and spot these four differences. And if you have any questions for me, just email me at naturejustgotreal at gmail.com. I'm always listening. This is Captain Jack signing off till next time. Bye-bye. That was an awesome answer, Jack. I'll be on the lookout to spot those differences in moths and butterflies from now on. I'll also put a cool graphic in the downloadable PDF that shows you the differences, so look for that in the show notes. And now here's Tito to give us some unusual facts about butterflies that you may or may not have known. I know I didn't. Take it away, Tito. And now, the weird and wacky creature feature. So you're getting a lot of butterfly facts thrown at you in today's episode, but I feel it's my job to tell you some of the weird facts you might not hear. So without further ado, here are 10 weird and wacky butterfly facts. Number one, they eat poop and drink blood, sweat, and tears. Yup, that's right. You want to think they're all like sipping nectar from flowers, all pretty like, and they are, but they're also looking for the minerals provided by the bodily functions of other creatures, including us. And including urine. Pretty gross. Number two. Some of them are carnivores. Rotting animal flesh is a big butterfly favorite. Actually, in butterfly form, they can only technically lick rotting meat, but there are two species of butterflies that are carnivorous in caterpillar form. 
like a harvester butterfly, lays its eggs on colonies of aphids, and when the caterpillars hatch, they have ready-made snacks available. The large blue butterfly's caterpillars live in ant nests and eat their larva. Mm, mm, mm. Number three, they are really picky eaters. Some butterfly caterpillars can only eat the leaves of one plant. Like in the case of monarch butterflies, they eat only milkweeds. That is called the host plant, and the adult female butterfly will only lay eggs on this plant that will feed the caterpillars once they hatch. So if you want more butterflies in your yard, do some research and have both the nectar sources and the host plants. Number four. They use ants as babysitters. One species of butterfly in the Amazon has the ants care for the caterpillars and the caterpillars give the ants nutrients in exchange. But when the caterpillars turn into butterflies, they steal the ants' food. How's that for a howdy-do? Ungrateful degenerates, I say. Number five. Some are a foot long and some are teeny tiny. The Queen Alexandra's bird wing butterfly can have a wingspan up to 12 inches long. And the smallest butterfly, the western blue pygmy, has a maximum wingspan of three quarters of an inch, about the size of an adult fingernail. So cute! Number six, some are not colorful. When you think of butterflies, you think of beautiful colors, but not all of them are. Some of them are gray or brown and look like moths. That's when you really want to know the difference between a butterfly and a moth so you can tell what it is. And some of them, like the glass-winged butterfly, you can see through. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Number seven. Some have colors we can't see. Butterflies can't see as many details as the human eye, but they can see colors that humans can't see, like ultraviolet. And many of them have ultraviolet in their wings, and scientists think they might use those colors to find the right mate. That makes sense. Number eight. Some use fake heads to trick predators. Butterflies would rather have a predator bite its wings instead of a vital part like its body or head. So some species have what looks like a head and antenna close to their butts. They can wiggle the fake antenna and make a predator think it's biting their head. They can still fly with big chunks taken out of their wings. Crazy, huh? And crazy smart. Number nine. They steal and use poisons. Some butterflies take toxins from their host plants to make themselves less tasty to birds. And that foot-long, wide Queen Alexandra's butterfly wing butterfly eats a toxic vine to drive predators away. Number 10. Swallowtail butterflies make us stink. When the caterpillar is threatened, they stick out a colorful, stinky organ called an Osmeritium, I don't know what that is. Osmeterium. Mm, that's a long word. It looks like a snake's tongue and makes them seem a lot less tasty. And did I mention it stinks? <laughs> that's a good idea. So there you have 10 weird and wacky facts about butterflies you may or may not have known. And how fun will it be to gross out your teacher and your friends with ease, huh? I'm Tito, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks, Tito. I know that was a lot of talking for you, but that was definitely one of your more interesting segments, for sure. And the word is osmeterium, <laughs> and is one of our weird and wacky vocabulary words for this episode. Okay, episode recap. What are my takeaways from today? Number one. Butterflies are a good indicator species that can tell us how our environment is doing. Two, if you want to attract butterflies to your yard and help them out, don't forget about the host plants. What type of plants do the caterpillars need to survive? Google that for your area. Number three, I'm going to say proboscis when I'm being serious and proboscis when I want to be more fun. Why choose? And didn't the paper towel reference blow your mind? I was like, wait, what? They aren't sucking up nectar like a straw? It's the quicker picker-upper. 
Number four, I will be looking for the differences between moths and butterflies so I can identify what I'm looking at and inform my friends so I look really smart. Number five, I will also stupefy them with the gross facts about what butterflies are really eating so I look like I'm not afraid of the disgusting truth. Can you handle the truth? I think so. What are some of your takeaways from today's episode? And don't forget to check out the recommended reads and the list of cool activities in case you want to raise or attract your own butterflies. Until next time, go have a flittering, sweat-drinking adventure in your neighborhood. That wraps up the show for today. Thank you to our sponsor, Weird and Wacky Planet. And thank you for listening. Thank you for caring and thank you for sharing. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Let us know if you do and we might mention you on the show. Until next week, go have an adventure in your neighbourhood.